Welcome to Access Church. We're stoked you're with us. Before we get into the teaching today, grab your Bible, your note sheet, and maybe your favorite beverage, and be ready to receive all that God has for you today. Well, we don't have a lot as we get going here. We don't have a lot to announce. We have a praise, though. I was talking to Stan when he came in, and you guys are praising for that. Hey, Stan's here. Hey, praise God. <laughs> you made it. <laughs> Um, and then uh, I know a few people live out towards that, that fire, uh, and I don't know the exact status, but I think the rain helped a lot, but huge uh, uh, prayer, answered prayer. The second time this happened to Stan, he's got property out there. The fire came up to the property line, right? And so no structures were damaged, everyone's safe, things like that. So we have a lot of those stories, so thank God for that storm. That was kind of a, a godsend, so yeah. But uh, other than that, that's, that's all that's been going on here. I've got a few other things to share, but I'm actually going to put it as far as a part of the sermon. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2. Um. We're starting a new series uh, where we're going through the book of Ephesians. I just want to encourage you, uh, people that track and, and read while we're doing the sermons, I swear, I, don't, I haven't done like a, a you know, scientific method on this, but I know from connection groups, they're getting more out of it. Just encourage you, get in it before, get in it after, and watch how things kind of pop up. Uh, we'll be in the book for about a month and a half, two months. The next few weeks, um, so I leave today going to be going on an a elk hunting trip, and so Ephraim will be uh, teaching next week, and so, uh, and then we have a guy named Keith, who used to be a church planner in the Philippines. He spoke here years ago. He's going to come share his heart, so we might take a, a week or two break. Um, Ephraim's still kind of figuring out. Be praying for Ephraim, too, because the dude is crazy busy, and then thrown on top of that, prepping for a sermon. So just pray for the family and all that kind of stuff, because usually when that happens, kids go crazy, and life is nuts when you're trying to prepare a sermon, so... Um, but that's what's happening for the next few weeks uh, with that. But we are in Ephesians, and we're going to be in chapter 2 today. Uh, and Paul, just so you know, real quickly, Paul's using the first three chapters as an encouragement, and also he mixes in a prayer. So it's almost like he's praying. And remember, someone else is dictating this. So he's having, you know, Timothy or Titus, someone, and they're, he's in prison. They're dictating, they're writing this down, and he's kind of like encouraging them, and he's praying at the same time. And what he's trying to do is set them up like, hey, you need to have a, a proper framework as a church because chapter four, five, and six, I'm going to tell you how to live. Like literally, how to do marriage, how to raise kids. I'm going to get in your business. So the reason I'm going to get into your business is because, and he's, he, the first three chapters help us have the mindset of like, oh, that's why he's kind of through uh, the Holy Spirit telling us like how to really live this out as a church and marriage and family and your society, things like that. So that's where we're at in this. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to jump into a very popular passage, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. If you've grown up in the church, very popular. We're going to break this down, and hopefully it's, it's going to be something that's really encouraging for you uh, today. Jesus, uh, always appreciate how you communicate reality to us. Because the most difficult thing is the world is telling us that reality is how we look, how much money we have, what other people think of us, what we post how many likes we get, and everything in this world is just living for the now, and you tell us about the future, about eternity. You give us a reality of the spiritual world, about how people are sinners, about how people need redemption, about how real love works, how marriage works, how raising kids, and how it's completely different, and thank you for showing us reality, God, that we can embrace it, know it, and most of all, God, that you're part of that reality, that we live with purpose, we live with hope, Jesus. So thank you so much in your name. Amen. Um, when I was growing up, to me, the worst person in my group of friends, and we all fall victim to this, but the worst person was someone that was fortunate and didn't realize it, right? You know those people growing up? I had the friend that, um, that got a new, this was, uh, I think, my junior year, they got a new car, given to them by their parents, comes to school and complains because it's not the car that they want. 
And we were just like, shut your mouth. Yeah, like, I was really weird. I was one of those kids, like, I don't know why, but I always became a friend, uh, friends with people that were richer than me. I'm like, why couldn't I find someone poorer than me? You know, so I could kind of feel good about myself. But I'm like, like my parents are like, you ain't getting crud. You ain't getting a college education. You ain't getting a car. You could ride a bike. And they're like parents giving them cars and stuff like that. And, and, uh, and so I was just in my, my brain just being like, I just, like, I don't remember a lot about growing up, but these certain snapshots, I don't know if you're like me, like you really snapped. I just remember my head being like, if he wasn't a friend, I'd just punch him. Like not even say anything. Like not say, hey, I'm going to hit you. I just want to hit him. Like why? Because there's something in us when someone is fortunate and they don't recognize it or they trash it. They don't take care of it, right? They get the, they get the car and they just run it to the ground. They don't take care of it, right? Because they don't own it. This is what Paul's going to be talking to us about because many times we do this with Jesus. We do this with God. And he wants to remind us, you are fortunate. I don't care what's happening in your life right now. There are people in this room, people in our church, physical ailments, right? Exhaustion, stress, all this kind of stuff. And like, how do we, how do we navigate this life? Never forget how fortunate you are. It changes everything. And the reality is we are fortunate. It's not a mindset. Like, you got to will it. You are so fortunate. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Here we go. Paul says, as for you, and remember, in the Greek, it's you all. As for you all. Now, who is this you all? Ephesians is a crazy church. You've got two people group that have grown up hating each other, and now they're supposed to get along in the church. This is what makes the church so weird and why a lot of like what called Gentiles or Greco-Romans, people who weren't Jewish, they didn't understand like why are you hanging out with those Jewish people? Like they look down on them. Like they're this small tribe that make up things about God and and they don't understand. You got to remember in that society, in that Greco-Roman society, they really valued, that's where all the philosophers came from. Those of you that are like in college, right? All those philosophers, Greek philosophers, they loved that. They thought they were the smartest nation. They were the most prosperous. They ruled Okay, there's nations like that today. We live in that nation. Very blessed. Other nations look to them. That's the Greco-Roman, right? And there's a little bit of arrogance that comes with that. We're smarter than you. We're more well-off than you. And obviously your God isn't a very good God because look at you, right? And then you have these Jewish people that are like, yeah, because you follow the devil, because we know the laws, you don't. We are the chosen nation, which means you're not chosen, right? I mean, they had this... And God's like, yeah, I'm going to make a church where those two people come together. Like whatever strife we have today, which I think a lot of it is manufactured, but whatever strife we have today, div- divisions in politics, can Republicans and Democrats actually come into the same room? Like some of us are like, there is no way in God's green earth. Like even Jesus is like, no, that can't happen, right? Like we have these divides, or maybe it's social economic, right? It's kind of difficult. You got these uh, uh, differences there. It could be ethnicity, right? You have all these things that can divide us, right? And the church is meant to unify. It's the beauty of the church is people should walk in saying, there's someone from everywhere here, right? And so Paul's speaking to this group that have grown up, like their parents taught them, like they are dumb, or they, we hate them, or they're not of God. And now all of a sudden the Christians are like, oh, this is weird, and they're coming together, walking in the same room. So he says, and as for you all, you all were dead in your transgressions and sins. Now that's an offense to some, Right? Now, for those of us that kind of had some wild days, right? We have those testimonies that people cry at or they clap at, right? And, and those in the church are kind of the big testimonies. Like, those are the ones, like, those are the ones we want to get on stage. Like, you know, have you done something really bad? Like, come on stage, you know, because that inspires us, right? And then some of us are like, I don't ha- have you ever thought, I don't have a testimony? My wife's that way. Like, I don't have a testimony, right? I just kind of popped out of the womb, and they're like, you're going to follow Jesus. My wife's like, okay, sounds good, right? And she's always trusted. Like, God's been, like, I I recognize, I heard his voice. Like, it's it's authentic. And what Paul's saying is, no, 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 you all, whether they stamp Jesus on your forehead when you were born, which they did, right, in the Jewish faith, is like, boom, dedicated, you're in. Even if the baby hasn't chosen yet, you're in, you're part of the nation. Or you're like the Greco-Romans where it's like, oh, I got some wild stories, but Jesus saved me. No, 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 you all are in the same boat. Very important as a church, we understand that. You were dead in your transgressions. Now, if you want to circle underline that we're dead, it's a metaphor because obviously people are alive. Obviously they're living, right? And here's the word that you could put there is by dead he means 
unresponsive or unconscious. You are unresponsive and unconscious because of your sin. Okay, you can't respond. And so he says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit, and he's talking about Satan, who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Paul's given a, a perspective here where he says, listen, it's not just this thing of like people, our personalities are bad, situations are bad, I grew up in a bad circumstance. There's a spirit in spirits that infiltrate and influence people who are unconscious to the truth and can't respond and keep them what the Bible says. Have you heard this? In bondage, in chain, you read that? So he's framing a theology here. And that really helps us as a church to maintain kindness, that when we are saved, we maintain kindness and compassion and love for those disconnected from Jesus. So we're conscientious of what we post about people who are not believers. We're conscientious of how we treat people who are unbelievers. In a sense, we're victims when we're dead. Right? So when our kids grow up, it's not us versus them mentality. It's, oh, they need Jesus. They're, they're not responsive. We get to bring light to them and literally life to this world. He says in verse 3, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following the desires and thoughts. And so he's labeling what transgressions are. When we talk about being dead to transgressions, a lot of times it's doing the bad things, right? It's, it's really bad things like, you know, just whatever those behaviors are that we, that we deem just like gross or bad. And what he's saying is like, this is why we're all dead. Because as soon as we're born, all of us try to gratify our own desires. And that's what makes us dead to God. It's in our nature. And if any of you don't believe that, all you need to do is bear a child. Does that child come out altruistic? Does the child pop out? It's like, Mom, what can I do for you? Anybody with kids under the age of five, do they run around being like, no, 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 Mom, let me do the dishes. No, 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 I got that. No, let me do that for you, right? Now, some of us are like, I, I don't even need a five-year-old. Like, some of us are like, my friends do that, and I'm 20. Or I do that, and I'm 40. It's natural. It takes a lot of work to not be that way. And if you try it on your own, you always kind of snap back to just a selfish way of doing things, right? Why do a lot of us get into friendships? By what we can get out of it. Why do a lot of us get married? By what we can get out of it. And so it's just, it's kind of in our nature. And so what he's saying is that alone, you don't have to go murder someone, go OD five different times, you know, uh, go do have a crazy testimony. You don't even need that. As soon as you are born, you were dead in your transgressions immediately because instantly you were selfish. Instantly. So he says, we're all in the same boat. It doesn't matter how great the sin is. All sin in God's eyes make us dead to him. Right? So that slows us down with how we view other people. And if any of us have ever wondered, like, how can you forgive really bad sins against you? I mean, I grew up, I have multiple generations of abuse. Horrible, sexual, physical abuse. Like, how do you get there, Brian? How do you tell those stories? Like, my mom, I remember forgiving her dad. Forgiving her dad for atrocious things. And me, it was like, how do you get there? This is how you get there. Is when you realize that the worst abuser, that I'm actually closer to him or her in character than I am to Jesus. Where many of us think we're closer to Jesus in our character and so we distance ourselves from those kind of people. And what the Bible says, uh, -uh you're much closer than you think, so be careful. And he's going to go on to say why, why we should be so careful, because he's saying, verse 4, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us, what's that word? Is it up there? I'm not looking, I'm hoping, I'm trusting that Gavin, yeah, you got it. They're just unresponsive, Gavin. They're dead to me, right? Yeah. What's the word? He made us what? Alive. Are you seeing contrast there? Dead, alive. Jesus, the truth of Jesus, actually makes you alive when you incorporate it into your life. When you have faith, when you respond, it's all him. 
It has nothing to do with us. Do you realize that you being a Christian actually has nothing to do, in a sense, with you? He is the one who even gives you the ability, because dead people can't talk. Dead people can't respond. There has to be something outside of them that makes them respond, right? And so you do that. What are those things? Those charger? What is it called? Def- defib- defibrillator. Yeah, defibrillator. Chi-chi. You've seen that on the, mo- on the shows or movies, right? The dog. Chi-chi, right? And you like that noise? Chi-chi, right? That's my sound effects. <laughs> Without that, they couldn't do it on their own. There was no way. I was thinking about this, this as a weird illustration, but it's like, I just remember uh, as a kid to a teenager when it came to girls. I was a, the boys, boy, boys, boy. Girls had what? Cooties. And I know what cooties are. And don't tell me if it's bad. I don't know. I never, I never Googled it, but I remember as a kid, cooties, right that. I remember I went to a Christian school for a little bit and I got in trouble because we'd play sports and I was fanatical about it. And so I, I would try to organize it at recess and who did I want to exclude? Girls. So I'd have this massive game of tag, but it was football tag. You can't just touch, you gotta, and then here comes little Susie. Oh, I want to play. <sighs> right? Something in me that just didn't like girls, and then this magical thing called puberty happened. Oh, I don't know. I just woke up one day. My voice started cracking. I started changing, but all of a sudden, I saw a little Susie. And I'm like, I don't think Susie has cooties. I wouldn't. She can play tag, right? I don't know what happened, but something changed, right? I was dead to girls, and I became alive around 12 years old, right? And all of a sudden, I wanted to smell good. Like, I never cared about how I smelled, right? And all of a sudden, I was like, mm, Susie wouldn't like that, right? Begin to think, I remember even at church one time, and this is when I knew I was changing, we were playing a game, and it was this game where you like, I don't know, you had to like uh, grab something from someone, and it was this big circle, it was just, I don't remember the exact game, we were playing this game, and we get done with it, and I thought I'd dominate, I was like, like, you know, I was so into it, you know, I was like, oh yeah, dominate, all right, number one, and one of the leaders is like, uh, I think the girl's name was uh, actually Kristen, or Kirsten, something like that, but, he's, but he said, oh, you like that girl, and I was like, no. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, yeah, I do, right? But I guess I didn't realize he's like, uh, yeah, every time she got the thing that you're supposed to steal, you went after her hard. Like, like, I guess I was like a beeline for her every time she got it. And I was like, oh, shoot. I was kind of like showing my hand, like, you know, I liked her. What happened? Something changed in me. I was unresponsive to girls. And something like biologically, and that's what puberty is like, it's a biological thing the way God created us. It's like, oh, and you become responsive to Jesus says, listen, you were dead. Like, you couldn't even recognize Jesus, the truth of Jesus. You're dead. You're unresponsive. But God loved you so much. He changes. And it's not the chemical, physiological. It's the spiritual that your heart now can respond. It can worship. All of a sudden, you care about what God thinks. All of a sudden, now you used to live for yourself. And you find yourself serving and giving money and going down and doing things. You're like, what am I doing? And all of a sudden, rather than being argumentative, you want to become peaceful. And all of a sudden, you used to be judging. And now you want to be forgiving. Like, and God does these things in you. And he says, don't resist it. It's because he loves you that he's changing you. You see, some of us think God is changing us because he's condemning us. No, if you were unresponsive, God, if you had no conviction at all, that's a bad thing. That means you're unresponsive. Having conviction of like, oh, God, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't think that. God's like, that means you're alive. When you're dead is, there's no repentance. You're like, ah, whatever. And you just keep doing, well, that's what I do. That's what I feel like doing. You're dead. So don't ever have shame with conviction when God's like, change it. It's he loves you. And that means you're alive. You're responding to him. And so he says that, listen, you are made alive with Christ even when you were dead in your transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. So God's grace is expressed through Jesus Christ. The cross expressed through his words to you, his truth, his comfort. And here we go, verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. 
And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no man can boast. Verse 10, for we are God's handiwork. Uh, Just so you know that word handiwork, it literally means construction or project. You're like a science project to God. But what does that mean? That means he doesn't want to make you better. It means that he wants to make you completely different. Know this, God saves you not to kind of tweak you, but to completely reconstruct you. Have you ever met people that they don't go to church, they don't read the Bible, they don't trust Jesus, but you're like, you would be a good Christian. Have you ever met people like that? Like, I, I, I've met people that I'm almost like, I got people in my neighborhood, I'm like, they're almost more Christian than me, but I'm a Christian. But the way they act is very Christianese, right? But the problem is that it doesn't matter. Your morality can't get you to heaven, only a relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the one that has to build you up and construct you. You don't build yourself up in righteousness. And so he says, we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Paul is demolishing this church in Ephesus, saying, you Jewish people that say, yeah, we have the Old Testament, we have the laws, shut your mouth. You were dead, and it was by God's grace, not by the laws that you were saved. You Greco-Roman people that you're so smart, you're so brilliant, you can debate anyone, and you think you have God figured out, shut your mouth. You are dead, just like the Jewish people are. And so he's uniting them in this graciousness, saying you all have experienced God's grace. This is the difference between religion and relationship, by the way. Religion is the arrogant process of using self-righteousness to connect with and appease God. That's what religion is. Religion is I will use my righteousness, these acts, in order to get God to like me. And God doesn't do religion. Christianity is the gracious process of God using Jesus to connect us and to appease God. He makes our way to us. We don't make our way to him. The power of grace. That's what Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 is about. The power of grace. If we get that as a church then we will always be fortunate. No matter if the bank account is low or if it's high, the kids are good, they're not so good. My health is solid, I'm a little bit off. I can always have that, I'm a fortunate person. I'm so fortunate because I was dead and now I'm alive. And I think we lose that, that's precious, right? Someone was asking me how Aiden is doing. My son's up at a, a Young Life camp working up there, right? We miss him. But there isn't a day that goes by, and he's told his story. This is public, right? There's a day that goes by that I'm not thankful for him. And that went up a notch when he overdosed. And we literally went downstairs, and his body was lifeless. And so who does he have to thank, right? Family and firefighters who saved his life. There was nothing he could do. Nothing. And how does that make life so precious every day after that? No matter what happens, like, bro, you're alive. Oh, no, you know, I don't know what I want to do in the future, and am I going to keep working with Young Life, or do this, and real estate, and all that? Bro, you were dead. You're alive. Son, I could care less. I'm just glad you're alive. And we got to keep that with Jesus, that when you get stressed, he's like, you are dead, and you're alive. Relax. Two things I want to leave you with today. The power of grace, you can write this down. Um, Gavin, you want to throw this first point up? Power of grace, one is it moves us from arrogance to humility. It moves us from arrogance to humility. We should daily walk with humility. Walk in humility, parents, with your kids because you are just like them. And if you don't think so, it's just because you forgot it. So show them some grace. Show those family members grace that aren't saved yet. Why? Because you weren't saved too at some point. And they're dead. They're dead. They're dead to Jesus, and so part of your job is to help them to become alive to Jesus, to show them Jesus. That's why you're his handiwork. He's he's working on you. He's working in you so he can work through you. His grace isn't a reservoir that just sits with you and there's no outlet to. You are the reservoir where he pours in his grace, and so you can pour those out to other people. God makes us conscious to grace, allowing us to trust him and put our faith in Jesus. And we are fortunate no matter the circumstances. Proverbs 11, 2, put that one up there, says this. 
When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. If many of us think about times of disgrace in our life or times of shame in our life, a lot of times we like to blame God. God, why'd you allow that? I think what God is saying is, no, it's your arrogance that got you there, not me. My plan for you is to be humble. And I don't know if you guys have noticed this, like those of you at work and things like that. A lot of times, it's the quiet, humble ones that start moving up. And the loud, arrogant ones, they move up quickly, but then they kind of hit a ceiling or they get found out and then they get demoted. Humility gets you a lot further in life. And I know we're a society that we love to be braggadocious about how we look and what we're doing and taking pictures and all that kind of stuff, but it's a short-term fame. And God's like, listen, you'll get an instant bump, but there's always a fall with pride. Stay humble. Think about others more than yourself. Stay humble. However good you're doing, it's all because you're fortunate because God blesses you. It's not because of your own hands. He gave you the intellect. He gave you the talent. He gave you the relationships. He put you in that marriage. He put you with that friend. He moved you to that city. Really, are you going to take credit for all of that? Uh, Old school pastor John Stott, if you read any of his books, I encourage you, brilliant thinker, pastor, writer, said this, pride is our greatest enemy yet humility is our greatest friend. Pride is always your greatest enemy in life, even spiritually, but humility is your greatest friend. Number two is this, the power of grace is it gives us a greater purpose. God saved you in order to work through you. God's grace is not just that he saved you, it's now that he uses you for a greater purpose. And here's what I want to encourage you with. Um, a lot of times people are like, I remember uh, people when I was younger, I was like, well, what's your purpose? Like, what's your purpose? And, and we think just having a purpose is a good thing. But no, having a good purpose is a good thing. But there are people that are purposeful in the wrong way. They're purposeful for money, right? Or they're purposeful for just things for themselves. It doesn't mean that it ends in a good way. Being purposeful itself doesn't mean that that's a good life. You can be purposeful with foolish, dumb things. God actually gives us a long-term, supernatural, powerful purpose. And that's what his grace does. It gets us out of ourselves, and then we're a part of his plan in doing incredible, awesome things. Philippians 2.13 says this. Remember this. It is God who works, what? In you to will and act in order to fulfill his good purpose through you. I added that. It's not in the Bible. And you probably shouldn't add things to the Bible, but that's what he means. God works in you to will and to act in order to fill, fill his good purpose through you. This week, you guys, do you believe that God has plans for you to do good things because you're a project that he's working on and that he has assignments for you because he saved you? Like, do you really believe that? Or have you already planned out your week? Is it already booked up? Is there any leeway where he's like, changes? Or do those changes bother you? I don't want to spend time with that person. I don't want to give up that. I don't want to lose money there. I don't want to lose time there. Are we leaving room for God to do his project? Or are you, God, I want you to save me, but I want to build my own building in my life. And what I would say in that is then you don't understand God's grace. You don't think you were dead. You think that you were alive and that you're a pretty good person and God just kind of just adds a little bit of paintings on the wall and kind of paint your house, but your house is pretty much good with the way you built it. And he says, no, it's horrible. It's going to fall. I'm going to completely rip it apart and build something beautiful and new. I want to encourage you this week to live that kind of life, that you were dead, you're alive, you're fortunate, and not just to be alive, but now to be used and be a part of God's purpose. And are you listening to him saying, God, what are you building? What are you doing? What do you want to change? Thank you for convicting me. I'm not living in shame. I'm living that by grace because of his love. And I'm aware of what he wants to do in me and through me. There's a picture um, that I want to show. Uh, can you put the picture frame? It should be a, like a, you see that? That woman's name is Juanita. I'm going to tell you why it's a, a picture frame in just a second. Uh, Friday, just so you know, got to go down to Tijuana Christian Mission in Rosarito, part of the inauguration. By the way, you guys were part of it. Our church gave $20,000 over the last year and a half, just so you know. So if you didn't mean to do that when you gave, sorry, that's what we do with your money. 
I love, I mean, what, one of my favorite parts of this job, you guys, is I get to be generous. People in the church be outside, so thank you. It's really fun, and I get the credit you don't, so it's awesome. I'm like, oh yeah, you know, no, I don't. I give you guys some credit, so. But it's fun. It's all, I get to go down, I represent the church. It's so cool. And I'm like, hey, it's our church. I mean, it's just, and we got to be a part of something really cool. It's the first women's shelter that has ever been established in Tijuana that's not transient as far as moving from home to home. Juanita here, the picture of her, is um, she was a woman who visited about 20 years ago. She was abused as a young girl, came to know Christ. You could look at that and say, I'm a victim. I've had bad things happen. Why did God let that happen? And maybe never follow him. But God showed her that, no, 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 that he has a purpose for you. She felt like damaged goods, but no, no, no one's damaged when Christ does reconstruction on you. Make you into something beautiful. Married a man and kind of lived a suburban life for a while. What's God's purpose? What's God's purpose? Well, they're accumulating wealth. Oh, is this all for us? And she just always had a thought of knowing God's going to use it. God's going to use it. Partnered her with Tijuana Christian Mission. And they loved it, and so they bought some property in Rosarito because they wanted to go to the mission uh, more and visit them in Tijuana. While she's doing this, she got cancer. I don't know if you've ever been following God and, and then bad things happen. You're like, well, why do I follow God and bad things happen? Like, come on, I'm trying to do good things and it doesn't work out, right? Well, God saved her, literally saved her life. Healed her, cancer again. She died. And so her husband, John, said, listen, this property was for us to visit, but her heart was always that you guys would have it. So he donated the property that now fits this shelter. And what they did is, in order to honor her, is that they named it the Juanita Women's Shelter. Her legacy will be there. Her picture will be there. You see, many times when God fulfills his purpose, it might be in this life or you might be done, but his purpose continues forever. Here's the video that I got to take of the inauguration. Check this out. That's John, the white hair there. That's his wife was Juanita. That's his granddaughter next to him. She got to receive the picture. Sarah, she's the one that cut the ribbon there. I think that's good. I think that's all I did. Um, just so you know, Sarah too, this is how God works. Sarah, who's the daughter of the woman that started this whole thing back in the 60s, Sarah uh, lived in America for a while, got in an abusive relationship. So she got abused, and Juanita was abused as a child. God will always take your greatest misery and turn it into your greatest ministry if you let him. Don't run away from your pain. Let God use that for ministry. These women partnered together. It took 20 years to happen, and now they have that shelter. Are you guys seeing? By grace you are saved, but not just saved. You are God's handiwork. You're his project now. Trust him with your life for the greater purpose. Your purpose isn't grades, money, looks, relationships, friendships, likes, all that kind of stuff. That's the world. You're living for the wrong purpose, greater purpose. Jesus uses you to build up others, and a lot of times it'll be from your greatest wounds will come your greatest victory. This is Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, you guys. So we don't live in shame because we're not judged by a God who pursued us. He pursues us out of grace. We're only judged if we're arrogant enough to think, I don't need your grace, I'll do it on my own. Then he's like, oh, it's on. But when you're humble, God says, what does he remember? God lifts up the humble. And here's the cool thing to remember. If God lifts you up, it's always higher than you can lift yourself. You cannot lift yourself high enough. God can lift you even higher. I don't think Juanita went into this being like, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to die, and this, and my name will live on. No, no, no. But God's like, you know, Juanita, God's going to get the glory, but I want to bless you. 
your picture's gonna be there. So people always know the story of how this was started. So even the women that show up there, they're humble as far as like, hey, you're just one woman, part of a greater journey, and here's what they're gonna do. That woman's gonna heal there, and then she's gonna realize, you know what? You're not a victim anymore. You're a victor in Christ. And then that woman will be inspired by Juanita, and that woman will do greater things, and we're gonna see greater things ahead. And this is why we're partnered with them, you guys. This is why I love going down there. We're gonna be going again in October. By the way, I don't think I, I took the picture, but we got to visit uh, Yuvia, the girl that we're sponsoring. All we did is give her a coloring book, and she was just so excited. Thank you for those of you that sponsored. Just, you know, your kids love to see you. If you're not sponsoring, talk to us how. It's amazing to go visit them. But they, they want to see you, so they're excited to see you. So we'll be going down in October. Live a life. Never forget how fortunate you are in Christ. Stay humble, because God's got some amazing plans for you. That's Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. I hope we get it. If we get that as a church, the rest of the book, we'll really be able to seep it in and really understand it and really be able to live it out. Worship team's going to come up now, and as we just reflect and worship, these words are awesome this morning. I hope it really encourages and inspires you. Uh, we have communion, and communion always humbles us, because Jesus died in our place, and we never want to forget that. And so I just want to encourage you to take communion, just to do it out of joy, out of thankfulness, appreciation uh, for his forgiveness and his grace. You want to do it by yourself, that's fine. Maybe you and Jesus just talk. Maybe you want to do it as family or friends and just kind of pray together or anything like that. So we'll let you take communion during worship with however you want to do it. So Jesus, Paul does an amazing job of reminding us that we are not alive because we're smart, or because we chose you, or because we found you. Who we are alive, the only reason why we understand the Bible, the only reason why we, we, we desire to do any good things is it actually comes from you. So God, I pray we'd be a humble church. Stay away from arrogance. Stay away from looking down on people, thinking we're better than them, thinking we're smarter than them, thinking we're more righteous than them. Nah, it's you. You who are righteous, God. We give you all the glory. God, I pray we'd be a church that we praise you whether our circumstances are good and maybe for some of us we're exhausted or frustrated with you, but we still praise you because you are worthy of our praise because not only do you save us, God, we actually get to participate with you in an eternal plan. And when we invest our life in you, eternal things happen. Lives are changed. Whether we see it or not, we will see it from heaven. So give us a, a heavenly viewpoint, God. And may we worship you with a heavenly joy. In your name, amen. I think what Paul's just trying to set up is like, you know what's hard about life? It's not receiving God's blessing. It's just being reminded of how blessed you are every day. And I hope what you leave with today is don't be that person that you get a free life. Like my friend got the free car and people look at you being like, why are you, you're careless with it. Don't be careless with your life. Your new purpose is not your bank account, your dreams, your desires. If so, you're not a Christian. You, you never receive God's grace. It's that I'm dead to all that. I'm alive in Him. And the things of this world mean nothing because they don't last. But whatever God does through you will last. So don't diminish that work. Don't diminish any work where you give money, where you give time, where you give service, and you don't see the fruit, and you're like, ah. No, no, you might be gone. Frail, like this song says, just looking to see Jesus. And when you get to heaven, he's going to say, Phew. now go look on this earth, and you get to see the fruit. Don't lose hope. And don't get arrogant. Stay humble. That your best friend is humility. And you're going to see what God does with your life. Just be patient, okay? Um, you guys, thank you so much again, too. The orphanage just want to let you know. For a tiny church, they're like, you guys are freaks of nature. Thank you. They love it when we visit. Uh, by the way, two, uh, two boys, last minute, came in, no clothes. They literally had no clothes. They're wearing crap. And so when I went down, I got a call the night before. And again, because you guys give, I just said, Laura Lee, go shopping and buy the best stuff at Target. 
we got these two boys clothes shirts pants all that kind of stuff gave them a bag and again they're just like she goes we could always rely on you guys you guys were the first church to, that we thought of to, to give a call thank you guys for being committed and you'll never know the fruit you'll never know but you know you're a part of it so have a great day andrew thank you for starting the middle school ministry hope we had a great time Thank you to Children's Ministry, even though they're not in here. Lights on and chairs on the racks. You guys have a great, I know we're not eating food, so no, don't look around. No food for you this week, all right? Yeah, you guys. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. For more resources, to get involved, or to invest in the ministries at Access Church, visit go to Take care.